Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome, welcome. We are super excited you're here. Hopefully, you've enjoyed Adam Welcome as our Connect kickoff. You've enjoyed one session. Now you're already here at number two. We are just cruising along through our day. Just like we say in all the other sessions, please introduce yourself in the chat. We'd love to see who's here, where you're from, what you teach. Uh, we'd love to just get a little bit familiar before we start. Welcome, Rachel, Sarah, Chelsea, amazing. So, so good that you guys are here. We're glad that you're spending this time on Friday with us uh, to just learn a little bit more, invest in Seesaw, and especially learn from Kelly, who's going to be our expert here in just a second. Welcome, everybody. We'll give you just 10 more seconds before I kick things off. I've seen people from Illinois, New York, Minnesota, amazing, Texas. Oh, so good. California, we are all over the place. Amazing, amazing. Well, we'll go ahead and kick things off. Hello, everybody, and welcome. I am Chris from the Seesaw team, and welcome to the Math Workshop Reimagined. This is a workshop session. Kelly is going to be our amazing host here today. She's going to be guiding you through some amazing practices and then also giving you a little bit of work time as well. During the session, we encourage you to take notes, share insights, and be active while learning. Remember, you get points in the leaderboard for being active during sessions. In the top right, you'll see the chat. You can use that for sharing, connecting with other people. Right next to it is the Q&A. You can ask that uh, a specific question to the presenter or to myself if you want to. We'll be able to answer those one-on-one. -on -one. If you ask a question at any time, we'll make sure that we answer it. And if we have extra time, we can also address those right here in the session, or we will email you after the fact. There's a tab labeled handouts where you can find everything that Kelly is going to be sharing here as well. If you'd like to turn on the closed captions, please select the CC in the bottom right corner, choose your preferred language, and you'll be all set. Stick around until the end to get your PD certificate and for the swag giveaway. Now, I will pass it over to Kelly to kick you off. All right. Hello. Hello. As you heard, I'm Kelly. I'm Kelly Mitchell, and I am actually an ed tech support specialist for my district in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, I see you guys are from everywhere. This is great. I used to be a teacher kindergarten, first and second grade um, in Virginia and in New Mexico. So if anybody here is from Fairfax, that's kind of my old stomping grounds. Now I'm in Albuquerque. Ooh, I like those hearts um, and smileys. Um, so happy to have all of you here today to share some wonderful math workshop um, stuff with you. All right, so here's our agenda for today. I'm going to talk to you about what is math workshop. Now, I'm not the expert. There's lots of experts. I'm just going to share with you uh, my experience and my opinion and what I've kind of gathered along the way. Um, I've been teaching for 15 years, so I think I skipped that part before. So for 15 years, and I'm just here to share that experience with you. And hopefully you can share some of yours as well. And then we're going to talk about different types of uh, math workshop models and how to get started with planning your math workshop. And then the really great part, how we can integrate Seesaw into your math workshop. And then I'll leave you with a few resources. All right, so before we get started, we want in the poll, um, I wanna hear from you about what is your math workshop experience? So this doesn't have to be with Seesaw, just in general, math having a math workshop in your class. So before I even get in and tell you my opinion about what a math workshop is, we want to know, um, are you a newbie? You've never tried a math workshop. You've really been teaching your whole class at the same time. Um, and you really want to get started, then throw a one in there. If you feel like you are an expert and you could help me teach this today, um, then give us a five in there. And if you are an expert, let's hope you hear some new things from me as well. Um, or you can share something really amazing. All right. So as I'm looking at the poll, <clears throat> we're spread out a little bit, but we have a lot of two, threes, and fours. So we're right there in the middle. Maybe some of you have dabbled with Math Workshop. You've given it a try. Like a lot of new things, maybe you've given it a try and felt like it wasn't successful. I've been there. Um, and you're just looking for maybe some new ways. So good variety here. Um, and let's get started with what is Math Workshop? 
So I always think of a math workshop as a flexible space where we can really incorporate structure, um, but have that leveled practice so that all students are getting their needs met. So this is a great way to break away from teaching everybody the same thing at the same time and find a way to meet all students' needs and add that flexibility. And I think there's three main parts or three key elements when you're getting ready to create your math workshop. Um, you wanna have some type of mini lesson or math talk that can be at the beginning or the end. So remember, super flexible when we're talking about a math workshop. So you can start with your math talk, you could end with your math talk. Just making sure you're getting that conversation and that group instruction in. But then really filtering to that independent practice and that differentiation. So we want all students working at their level. And um, there's another one that I put in here would be collaborating. So we have that independent practice, but also allowing room for collaboration where students can learn from each other. And all of this together is really because it's going to be more engaging for your students. So sitting together on the carpet for 45 minutes, right, listening to your teacher talk is really a thing in the past. So when we get into math, we want students moving, we want some hands-on learning, a lot of digital learning, collaboration. All of this is gonna be more engaging for the students so that they can really shine and show what they know. And then for me, math workshop is really about providing a purpose and really meaningful learning for your students. And so a little bit about my story and why I started using a math workshop was um, I had 29 students teaching first grade, no EA, um, by myself, 29 students. I had 45 to 55 minutes for my math block, which sometimes seems unrealistic when we look at all of the standards and everything that has to be taught throughout the year. So I was sitting there thinking, okay, I have 29 students. I have 50-ish minutes to teach them. Oh, wait, and then I had all of these other components. I had 11 students out of that 29 who were English language learners, um, who were still really learning the language. Then I had a, a range of abilities in my classroom. I had students still learning their alphabet and numbers. And I had students at a fourth grade level really working into multiplication. And so I had to think of a way to meet the needs of all of those students um, and keep them engaged. So my solution was, let's learn how to do a math workshop. <laughs> and to keep it really meaningful and provide purpose for each of those students, I always um, decided to find a way where differentiation was at the forefront and that could be through content or quantity. So when I think of differentiating for the students, Seesaw is really helpful here because you might have a curriculum that is really not giving you a lot of leveled practice and it's giving you one activity for your entire class. So using Seesaw, I'm able to go in and differentiate the content and assign different leveled activities to different groups of students. Um, but also some students need maybe less practice with certain skills and more practice with other skills. So giving them the quantity that they need um, or if they're really fast workers and they need a little bit extra. Thank you. I see some of you are green, throwing some hearts there. Awesome. Um, and then the next component would be choice, providing choice so that students really feel connected and we get what's called that buy-in. Um, so we want students to buy into the process. We want students to buy into what they're learning so that they really feel connected. And choice is always like a winner, right? When we get choice, then we feel like we bought into that and we have a reason for what we're doing. So it could just be this activity or this activity. Um, or I like to give students a choice in the order they complete activities. I can't tell you how many times I had students, um, one group of students who want to do the really hard stuff first to get it out of the way. And then I would have another group of students who want to do the really easy stuff first so that they could get it out of the way because mentally they were not ready to tackle the more difficult work. So really offering that choice. Yeah, I see some of you agreeing too. Offering that choice about 
um, what order they complete their activities. All right, so this is where I wanna know, what are your barriers? So about half of you are really on the beginning um, stages of starting a math workshop. So what would be your barriers when you're trying to get started? This might be the beginning of your school year. Here in Albuquerque, it's the beginning of our school year. So we're all getting ready to roll into the new year and think about what is our system going to be that we're putting in place. So thinking about your barriers, what might they be um, as you're getting ready to tackle your new math curriculum for the year? And I'm gonna scroll down, I'm gonna give you a chance um, Throw it in the chat. Tell us what are your barriers. And while you're putting your ideas in the chat, here's some th three that I think are probably going to pop up and we'll see if they do. Um, time can always be a big barrier. I see some of you are saying you only have 30 minutes, 40 minutes. A lot of you saying time, time, time. Yes, it never feels like we have enough time. So we're going to find a way with Math Workshop to um, use the time you have in a really meaningful way. Class size can always be difficult. That was difficult for me when I had so many students. Um, a lot of you are putting curriculum in there. So maybe you're really bound to a certain curriculum. And I'm gonna show you some great resources within Seesaw to help you there. Um, or you feel like you don't have enough and you need supplement. And then I didn't see a lot in there for routine, but I think a lot of times once we get started or we want to get started with that math workshop, it's really wrapping our head around what is the routine and how do I get my students to follow that routine? Thank you everybody for putting your comments in the chat. All right, and just again, remember we're talking about this today because we want that flexibility, that leveled um, practice and we're meeting the needs of all of our students. So in my opinion and my experience, my, I think that Math Workshop has really two main models, and I have used both of these. Um, so in my mind, the first model would be a station model. So this is probably what you're more familiar with, where there's stations around the room. You have a table here and a table over there. And when students go to those stations, there's an activity waiting for them, and they complete the activity. Usually there's a timer and students are, when the timer goes off, they're moving from one station to the next and you have the same routine for the whole class. Um, that the stations are very much more structured and student driven, or sorry, teacher driven. Um, and the teacher is really sending the students where they need to go to get their activities done. Then I have used a rotation model where I allow students to stay in their own space or go use a different space in the room, um, but they are really becoming independent and running their, their rotations independent of the teacher. So students would be picking what they're doing and doing it in the order that they choose. This allows for a lot more choice. Um, I would not recommend starting with a rotation model right off the get-go. Um, your first day back. <laughs> so that's something that you would want to work up to if it sounds like something that would work for you. One of the benefits to the rotation model is teacher can pull back students, um, two students at a time, then five students at a time, and really be flexible with those student groups. Whereas the station model, a lot of times we think of students are in those set groups. So as we're thinking about those two models, and there certainly are there, there's other ways you could do math workshop, but those are really the two big categories for me when I'm looking at my class for the year. And so when I'm considering how do I want to run math workshop and what model is really going to work best, I really look at my room arrangement and my spacing. So if you lack furniture in your room or you have a ton of furniture and a lot of student desks or tables and you really don't have extra space in the room, that might be something you take into account. Um, the classroom personality. So this is a big one. You know that your classes never have the same personality. And every year as you start to get to know the kiddos and they come in, you really start to figure out, OK, what is the personality of this class and what works for this year probably isn't going to work for next year or whatever worked last year probably isn't going to be the same for this year. So I like to get to know the class a little bit. Um, sometimes some years I've had groups of students who just work really well together and could collaborate and play group games every day. 
and it was never an issue. Other years, I've had groups where students um, have a lot of behavior needs. And so we're managing some behavior needs and maybe some students really need more space. And so taking those things into account about how you want to make that space really usable for all of your students and make sure that it's functional. And then obviously your student needs and the number of teachers. So some years I've had teachers who are pushing into my room or a co-teacher. And so we can have two teacher groups during math workshop, um, which would really change our model versus years where I'm by myself with 29 students. So it really looks different. And then here's just a quick visual of what that station model might look like. This is probably something you're very familiar with, um, right? You have your mini lesson, then students are either an A, B, C, or D group, and then they're rotate, they're moving from one station to the next um, as you're directing them to do so. And then you'll see in that model, teacher table is one of their stations. So students have been grouped and they move in that group um, work together and come to the teacher table when it's time. This is the model that's really only uh, that's only allowing you to see those groups um, once a day. Or if you're working through four stations over two days, then you're seeing kids every two days. So this is a great structure to get started with. Um, but then you might move to something that looks more like this, very open ended. So as your class really gains independence and you have a nice flow, you can maybe open it up a little bit where you can move to a rotation model. And now students are going to all of these activities, but they get to choose their order and they can complete those activities um, how they need to. Some students might, might need to spend more time on their workbook activity, and then they can go to their you know, device activity once they're finished. Um, so I like this setup because it doesn't take everyone the same amount of time to do all the activities. So this is why I like to work towards a rotation model. And then also my big one for a rotation model is some students you'll know, you'll know, right? You need to pull them back every day. So I would have kiddos where three students, I might need to pull them back for just five minutes at the very beginning. And, and remind them of the tasks for the day, maybe do a check-in, um, remind them of the skills we're working on, and then they're ready to go be independent. And then I can start pulling back other groups for, for instructional content. So I like the flexibility here. Yeah, and somebody said they like a must-do, may-do list. Um, so many options here. Just making sure you have those visuals so students have some anchors around the room to really guide them what they need to do and where they can go. All right, so now you've decided what is your class like? What kind of model are you going to run for your workshop? And you're getting really into your planning phase. So when you're getting into your planning phase, really sit down, look at your curriculum. What are the requirements? Um, what available resources do you have? So really important before you start pulling stuff, for your math workshop, you're, I know you're excited, right? You just had summer, you saw these really great things on Instagram and you're printing them and you really wanna incorporate them into your math workshop. But make sure you're really looking into the, the curriculum that's provided and see what resources you already have and don't create something that's already there. Spend your time creating new content to really supplement um, and fill in those gaps with the other stuff. And then I'll show you when we jump into Seesaw here in just a little bit, I'm gonna show you how you can fill in the gaps by using the Seesaw, Seesaw Standard and Curriculum Alignment Tool. That's a mouthful. Um, but how you can use that tool, if you have not already used it, um, you're going to use it this year because it's amazing. So you can search by curriculum, you can search by standard, and Seesaw will show you all the lessons that already apply and that you can use and they're ready to go for you. And that's just a video you can go back to later. Um, and then of course you can always supplement with the other things that you've found that are super cute, you've used for years, um, posters around the room, and add all of this content in to supplement. 
All right, so now we're ready to get started um, thinking about that math workshop. So first thing, I sit down and start to create my groups. So this is probably not something you can do the first week of school because you don't know your students yet, you don't know the makeup. So after you've given it some time, you can maybe you've done some preliminary assessments and you know where your students fall, then you're gonna look at creating your groups. Um, building efficiency and assigning and grading will be very important once you have your groups built because you can assign different work to your different groups. Um, and I'll show you in Seesaw how you can build out your groups so that you assign the appropriate work to each student. <clears throat> and you can change your groups at any time. So especially once you're in a rotation model and you have that a more fluid movement around the room and students have that independence, I like that I can change my groups and students don't actually have to know what group they're in. Um, they just come back to my table when I call their name. And there's not really named groups. It's more just when I call your name, come on back. Um, if you have that station model, then you might want to wait to change your groups by unit or you'll change your groups quarterly or semest every semester. If you're changing them every week for that rotation model, it just might be too much because we're asking, you know, kindergartners, first graders, second graders um, to remember a lot of things. And that's a lot of visuals you'll have to provide on the wall to remind them of their groups if you're changing them every week. So really think about, you know, making those groups um, by unit, by quarter, or using more of a rotation model. And those groups are for you. You can change them all the time and call the kids back as you need to. Yeah, somebody asked if I use flexible groups. I do. So I like to have a very flexible model when I'm grouping the students. Um, and I might call, you know, students back to just get them on track for behavior. Then they might be in another group with students where we're working on addition practice. Um, and you can even have students in multiple groups, depending on what their needs are. Definitely using those pre-assessments for your grouping. All right, so I like to really live by this, especially in the beginning of school. There's a um, program and um, I have linked at the end where you can, the first six weeks of school, so you can check that out later, but pretty much the idea is go slow to go fast. So this is really with my entire classroom, the first six weeks of school, where we're spending so much time learning how to line up. We're learning how to push in our chairs. This applies to math workshop too. So we are learning each station or we are learning each rotation one at a time, um, really going over the expectations of what it looks like to be in a math workshop. What does it look like to collaborate in a math workshop? Um, teaching everything really explicitly and then following this model where the whole group is gonna practice. Now we're gonna practice in small groups. And then really increasing that time, starting with really one minute all the way to 15 minutes. So if we were learning how to play um, a group game, we're going to play that game for three minutes. And then tomorrow we might play the same game for five minutes. So really increasing that time. Um, and I will tell you, there's years where we get to seven minutes and it does not go well. And really, it was too much. The students kind of got off task. So we regroup, we review the expectations, and the next day we go back to three minutes again. Um, it's going to feel like a long time, right? You're going to spend six weeks doing this. You're going to feel like you're getting behind on curriculum. You're not, because then what's going to happen in January, when everybody comes back from winter break, um, they're all going to be struggling with getting back to their instruction, and your kiddos are going to be really good at their math workshop and you are just going to fly through the second half of the year and you're gonna take off. So go slow to go fast. And these are just some of the tips and tricks. Some of you have already mentioned these in the comments, which I love, um, having those visuals, making sure you know you have those to-do charts, um, the things that'll keep your, your students on track, setting those clear expectations, Allowing choice, I've seen a lot of that in the comments, always choice wherever you can, um, as long as you, you, know, you, you want those choices. 
offer them as much as you can. All right, so now let's talk about all the really good stuff. How can we work Seesaw into your math workshop? Um, so before I show you all these activities or different ways that I like to really include Seesaw into math workshop, I want you to think about when I was just talking about going slow to go fast. Um, when you're setting up your math workshop, I've heard a lot of times teachers say, I'm going to teach these paper pencil rotations and stations for the first two months. And then I'm going to incorporate all the digital activities. But if you think about that for a minute, now you're kind of setting yourself back where you have to go back to your go slow, go fast model, and you have to reintroduce stuff that wasn't already there. So it's I like to think of it as introduce it all in the beginning where you're only doing things for one, three, five minutes at a time and really build it into the routine. So if you plan on using Seesaw, which I hope you do, um, or any other digital component, start with it in the beginning. And if you feel like it's too much, um, just remember your students are really savvy and they're going to pick up on it. They're, they're really good with navigating on devices. So even if it makes you feel a little uncomfortable, really good to start in the beginning with all of your tools. Okay, so I want to look, send you another poll. And I want to know how many of you are already using Seesaw with math. This doesn't have to be with a math workshop. Just um, let me turn on our poll here. Okay, there we go. So now I wanna know who is going into Seesaw and using Seesaw for math. You might be assigning lessons you've created. You might be using the Seesaw lessons um, that have all of the different components. Maybe you're even going in and picking math lessons and using the present to class, and you're using them as interactive mini lessons with your class, anything, any way, if you're using Seesaw during your math instruction. Okay, so we have a few people that are saying always, like every day I'm using Seesaw, um, but there is a lot of you who are sometimes and wow, a lot of you say you've never used Seesaw with math. So I think today we're going to get you on board and we are going to show you how wonderful Seesaw for math is. Yes, some hearts there. You can also put some hearts on the screen too, all of you that say always. Um, yes, we're gonna show you what you can do. And I only have time to show you a few things in Seesaw. So as we get going or at the end, Make sure you share with us your great ideas as well. We want to hear from everybody. Okay, so when I get in here and we're first talking about using Seesaw for math workshop, there's two really big parts that have to happen. In my opinion, these things have to happen before you get started. So the first thing is organizing with folders. Um, think of this like starting off the school year with out any folders or any organizational bins, because I know, right, we have kindergarten, first, second grade here. Um, if you don't have any bins or folders or binders or any of those things to organize your classroom with your students, it would probably be chaos. And so think of Seesaw the same way. Um, before I even start using Seesaw with my students, I make sure that I have all of my folders in place. And I like to tell teachers, that anything that needs a folder in your class probably needs a folder in your digital class, which is your Seesaw um, class. I like to make sure that I'm using a color, a symbol, and name for the folders. So especially for the, those of you who are in kindergarten, first grade, you have really early readers, um, they're looking for those symbols and the colors of the folder so that they can stay organized. Yes, somebody says, yay, I wanna do this. It's so easy and um, we're gonna get you doing this. So setting up your folders, I like to go through and think about like, okay, what is everything I might need a folder for? And you'll see here on my list, you can do it by unit, addition, subtraction, um, place value, or you can keep it more general. Um, I add things like videos, games, vocabulary, all of those components have their own folder to make searching really easy. And then the other thing that I really like to do for math workshops specifically is have a whole separate class. So I would have my Mrs. Mitchell's class 
with language arts and morning work and reminders that are going out to families through messaging, all of this. But then I like to make a separate class with all of my students in it that's for just math workshop. Um, I actually would do this for writing workshop as well. And so math workshop is a whole separate class. You can really customize those folders so they are all about your math workshop. And this is a place where when students open their math workshop class, now they're mentally ready to jump in. They know where they are. They're not getting distracted by what's assigned to them for language arts later today um, or yesterday or your students who really struggle with writing and it's overwhelming. They're not going to see that writing activity that stressed them out. They can just jump in and it's all about math. Um, so I like to have a separate class. Once you've done those two things, you have your folders, you have your class, you're organized and you're ready to go. Then these are some of my favorite ways to include Seesaw into our math workshop. And I'm gonna run through these and then I'm gonna jump into my actual Seesaw class and show you how I create some of them. So the first one is mini lessons, right? We're talking about those mini lessons or maybe even a math talk where you can um, create a lesson and then just share it with the present to class. Now it's interactive for everybody to come up and interact with that mini lesson instead of students just sitting there listening or even just sitting there watching a video. Now we have that interaction piece on your Promethean board and you don't even have to assign this to the students. So love that, that Seesaw has that option for us now. My This one I'm gonna show you when we get in there. Whiteboarding is a favorite of mine. Um, I love that students can open their tablet, open their Chromebook, whatever it is that they have, and they can click that green plus, and they now have a blank workspace. Um, so think about you're in your math um, workshop, or you're getting ready for your math workshop, and you just brought your students to the carpet, and you're getting to, ready to do maybe a math talk, and you're asking students, okay, how many ways can you solve this problem? And then we're giving them the think time. If you're not familiar with um, a math talk, you're giving students think time. And I used to always have my students hold up here by their heart um, how many ways they can solve a problem. And they're just showing you how many different ways. They're not even telling you yet. And then after you have that think time for the ways they can solve the problem for today, then you have them go to their tablet. And now they're going to show you all the ways that they can solve that problem. So this is one thing I'm gonna show you when I jump into my class. Um, what is amazing about this is if we had a traditional whiteboard and dry erase marker, then everything gets erased. And there's no way, right, when I had 29 first graders that I could remember everything that was on every whiteboard once it was erased. So this is a great way to really collect what your students are doing. You have the data and I use this for other activities. So a lot of times, they're gonna do something on their whiteboard that was a way to solve a doubles fact. But then one of their stations for the week is to reopen that whiteboard and now they can record themselves explaining to me why they use that way and how they could do it a different way. So you can use that, you can really build on these whiteboards. Ooh, yay, somebody's like, I didn't think about whiteboarding, that's so cool. Um, I'm glad that we got that out there for you. All right, next one, math games, right? What would math be without games? Nothing, right? Math games are everything. So hopefully you're already playing math games. Math Workshop allows for tons of math games, hands-on learning. But what I really love is that Seesaw has now so many math games already built into their lessons. They're in English and in Spanish. So what a great way where all the directions are already written there and you can save them to a folder. And every time students are going to play a math game, you don't have to reintroduce the directions because now you have a folder that they can go to. They can read or listen to the directions again. They can watch a video on how to play the game. And thank you, Chris, for dropping that link in there. Um, and then they can play these games independently. So I love when my kindergartners are independent playing math games. I'm back there at the table working with a group of students and your kindergartners are watching a video, remembering how to play a game, playing a game with friends, maybe even recording themselves playing the game. 
and turning it in all by themselves, right? Building great independence. And then this is just a reminder for that digital learning. We're working this in the whole time. Um, if you have links or videos, really dropping those into your Seesaw class and building that as an expectation for students, but also for families, that families can revisit your Seesaw class um, to see what are those links, what are those learning videos? Because a lot of times parents forget how they learned to do these basic skills. So if you have that digital learning space in there with all those links and videos as like a hub, now everybody can revisit it and get to where they need to go. All right, hands-on learning, right? Here's some pictures of some of my students getting to build 3D shapes with marshmallows and toothpicks. We need to do this stuff. Kids need to do all this stuff. So using Seesaw to click that plus button and record their learning. And what I like to think about for this, because this is a big part of what I, when I'm teaching science as well, it's like when you go on a vacation or you do something fun or you go out to dinner with friends or you do something that really was exciting, you're taking pictures, you're taking videos, you're putting them on Instagram or Facebook. And you're sharing those moments and then how wonderful it is when you are with somebody else and you pull up those pictures and it jogs your memory of all the great things you did and then you can share with them so think about when you're doing those really great hands-on lessons that you're taking time to let your students take pictures take photographs or you're taking the pictures you're taking um, the video and you're dropping them into the seesaw class so that students can go back and revisit and really bring that joy that they have for math and share it with their families. And then reflection is a huge piece of math workshop. Every day we should be reflecting on what did you learn today? What did you experience today? Maybe what was a struggle today during math workshop? So really reflecting. But I like that in Seesaw, students can use all of the tools. They can use the camera, they can use the microphone, um, they can use the voice record, which is amazing for our students who don't want to be on video. Um, and they can attach their voice and their explanations. They can reflect on their learning for the day. Then their families can hear their reflection. You can hear their reflection. And then it really sinks in with them and they start to synthesize. But I really have like to have my students um, peer, use peer reflection. So students will complete an activity and then tag a friend, and then that friend is now going to give peer feedback. And I'm gonna show you this when we jump into the class. Um, that's one of the ones we're gonna go over. And then this one is a no-brainer. Um, this saved some of my students so many times. So having a video library where, think about, just take a quick second, how many videos do you share during math um, throughout the year? Probably a lot. You probably share a video. If you, a lot of you in here were kindergarten and first grade, you probably share a video almost every day for math um, for, for your students. So instead of just sharing that video on your screen and then them never getting to see it again, unless you play it for the whole group, consider taking that math video, putting it into Seesaw in your math video library. And now students can go back and watch those videos over and over again. The really great thing here is I would have students when they needed to take a break or they were feeling really overwhelmed, I would say, hey, why don't you go take a couple minutes, go to our take a break um, area of the room and go watch some of our videos and like regroup, take a couple deep breaths and come back. Students will go over there and they think they're like getting a treat and they're off task and they're watching these videos, they almost feel like they're sneaking something they shouldn't have, like it's candy, but really like those are learning videos that we want them to watch. <laughs> so this works for me for behavior um, and for math instruction. And then I do the exact same thing with a digital word wall as I do with the math video folder. So I have a word wall folder and everything that goes on my math word wall or every anchor chart that I build for math also goes into our word wall folder. That way, if students are, um, we changed units and that anchor chart is no longer on the board or they can't find it 
or think about our students who get overwhelmed with all of the stimuli on the walls. So those students can go to their Seesaw folder and go to their digital word wall and see one poster at a time. And I'll show you what that looks like when we jump in. And then the last one would be the blog. And I feel like a lot of teachers don't really wanna jump into the blog right away. So this is one that you could save for January to really introduce something new and exciting. Um, but I use the math blog to get students engaged and tap into their prior knowledge and really get them excited about a new unit by posing a question or a riddle in the blog. And then all the students get to put what they, their guesses are or their opinions. And then when we start the unit, I start with, with that question that I had posed. All right, so this is where we're gonna jump into, and that's just like a quick shot of the blog. So this is where we're gonna jump in and I'm gonna show you some of these things that I talked about and we'll see if we can get through all of them, then I'll throw some more stuff in there. Um, but let's go ahead and switch over. I'm gonna share my screen. All right, so now we're gonna get in here to um, my math workshop class. And before I show you about whiteboarding, I just wanna go over a few things. A lot of you are still saying in there how excited you are about folders. So I just wanna show you when I go in here to folders, I can see all of these ones that I've created, um, but you can quickly, when you go, whoops, when you go into your math class or your Seesaw class, sorry, you can come down here. Where is my folder one? I always pass it. There we go, I didn't go far enough. Okay, so once I come in here to my folders, then you can just say, create a new folder. You're gonna pick the color, you're gonna come in here, this one just happens to be there. It's fitness. Let's say we have fitness stuff. Click a check. That's how quick and easy it is to make a folder. So you can just come in here and make all of your folders at one time. They're ready to go. And then you can check off that, the steps that students and teachers can both add to the folder. So what happens when you do this is when students turn in an assignment, if you forgot to tag a folder, then it will ask students what folder it belongs in and they will have to tag a folder before they turn it in. And so it has to live somewhere, which is really great for organization because then it lives somewhere and it's not just in an endless feed. Um, or you can just say teacher always has to tag the folder and then students can't tag a folder. But since we're talking about whiteboarding, I will tell you it is important to allow students to tag a folder because when they whiteboard, so they're gonna come in here, click this green check, and they're going to add to student journal. Once they add to their student journal, should pop up here in just a minute. This is not when we want it to go slow to go fast. Let's see. <laughs> Let's hop over to my other math class. Let's see. So if I, okay, there we go. So if I add to, if I click the green check, then here we go. So we're gonna go in here to drawing. And remember, every student is doing this. You did not assign a lesson. You're telling them, click the green check. Everyone's starting their whiteboard. And then when I was talking about those doubles facts, here's what I would do with students. I say, everybody go to the background. I want you to pick a pink background for everything we do for the next couple or for the next problem. So they pick their pink background. Now, remember, we were talking about how many ways can you solve this problem? So if the problem today was five plus five, tell me what you know, how can you solve this? Then students are going to show you one way on each page to solve the number five or five plus five. So students can first come in here and they're gonna write it out and maybe they're gonna do this. And then if they have a different way, they come down here to the bottom, they're gonna add a page. It still needs to be pink because we're still talking about the same problem. We're just solving it a different way. 
So now maybe your student's gonna come in here and use tally marks. And what I love about this is they didn't have to wait to share with the class and you didn't get to only um, pick on three friends to share what they know. Every student is engaged in this math talk. Every student is showing what they know. They're continuing to add their pages um, as long as you, have the, you haven't called time. So you're gonna give them two minutes, three minutes, and they just keep adding pages. And it's okay if they look over and they see what their buddy's doing. Oh, I didn't think about that way. Well, now they thought about that way. And now they can add a new page and show how to solve that problem a different way. Once you're done, you can always say, everybody add a blank page. This time, don't make it pink. I want this one white. And I want you to save this page. And when you go to your station today, you're going to record your voice telling me all the ways you know how to solve five plus five. Now this is part of your um, math talk and it's one of your stations and you didn't have to assign anything to your students. You did it all in real time. Now students go ahead and click the check. They're gonna pick, I'm gonna say sample student here. They have to pick the folder. So this one was, oh, I'm in a different class. So we're gonna pick math and we're gonna turn it in. So you can see this class isn't my math workshop class. So I only have one math folder. Whereas the benefit of being in that math workshop class if I switch over to my math workshop class, then I can have folders that are really specific to math and they are not all, that I don't have everything for math into one folder. So there's a quick way to do whiteboarding. I also like to use this with um, phonics with the students, um, one of my favorites. Okay, next I told you I would show you my video folder. So in, in the class, you can go in here, and we already talked about creating those folders. So I'm going to go to my folder drop down, and I wanted to see right here. So I have, oh, that one doesn't have any. I have a lot of Seesaw classes. So I'm going to go in here and go to my videos folder. So these are all the videos that I would want for my students to be able to go back to and watch. And sometimes like these ones that you'll see here are Seesaw videos, um, but sometimes I just go to the green check and I say add to student journal and I'm going to open a blank page and then I'm gonna come over here to YouTube and I'm going to grab a screenshot of this video that we just watched. Now I'm gonna come back to my Seesaw class and I'm going to paste that screenshot so students recognize this video. And then you grab the link and you're going to attach the link in here. You're gonna put the link to the, whatever that video was. Now you just click the green check and you're going to say this is for everybody because you want it to go to everybody's journal and you're going to save this under videos. Now this video is going to populate in all of your student journals and it will be saved into the math video folder for them to go back and revisit. Quick and easy way to organize. All right, let's see, we have a couple minutes so let's talk about reflection. So when students come in here to, to reflect, I have this activity. This is a doubles activity. Oh, let me come back here. Okay, so I have this doubles, at, doubles fact activity. Students can click on these three dots and say edit people. Once they come in here, you can see that I have shared this activity with Haley Mitchell. So Haley might be my math buddy. So you've assigned math buddies, they have one buddy they can maybe share their work with, or one person out of your group you get to share it with. Sometimes it might be two people, but they're sharing this activity and clicking the check. Once your student does that, this activity will populate in both students' journals. And so both students can get in and access the exact same activity. So now I would have students where they could either collaborate so sometimes you say, okay, I want one student to go in and write 
four equations and then click the green check and turn it in. Then the other partner is going to jump in and put four new equations and they can work back and forth. Sometimes I have them use different colors and on the page they can add recordings and tell me who did what. Um, great way to collaborate, but also great way for feedback. So you could also have students come in here and click the comment and your younger students can just use the microphone and they can record um, their voice comment or they can come in here and type their comment um, and give some feedback for their friend. Quick and easy way for reflection. I'm not gonna go over like the video because I think we all know how to add a video once we're in a lesson and that's a little bit more straightforward. And let's see, Chris, we're right about at time. So I think this is where we're gonna go to Q&A um, and we have some giveaways, right? So that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I do have one question that I saw come in from a couple different places and I wanna just, see if you had anything to share. There was a lot of people who were new to whiteboarding. They were new to this, okay. not only just, I think, whiteboarding within math, but also within CISA. Um, could you just share some resources with everybody here about how where they can kind of improve their whiteboarding game? Sure, sure. Like you want me to drop in some links or just talk about it a little bit? Sure, I think talking about it, if you do have links, wonderful. Uh, but I think, you, can you just share a little bit, like where can somebody go to learn more about how to be better at whiteboarding? So I think to just be better at whiteboarding, I really like to just go in and I mean, to be honest, I just think of whiteboarding as whatever you would do on a whiteboard, just think of going in and doing it by clicking the green plus sign. It's really that easy. Um, so that's how I think about it. And I like to tell teachers when I'm training on Seesaw, I always tell them like assigning an activity, actually creating my own activity in Seesaw is probably what I do least in Seesaw. I really use whiteboarding as probably my number one way to use Seesaw with students. And then I really go look at like the Seesaw resources and people like Chris, who I follow on social media, who post really great content. Um, those are kind of my three go-tos when I'm using Seesaw. That's awesome. Um, one more final question here, um, again, on this whiteboard topic, when students are doing this, the question was asked, do you check students work within that? Or is that simply just a practice opportunity? Yeah, the great question. So I do, and I see some people are talking about this with language arts as well, um, cause I do whiteboarding with both, but I do like to go back and look at the data and look at what students did especially when you get into like the basics and you want to know where they're making those mistakes on solving problems or on spelling words. Um, if you do not have folders set up, then it's really hard to grade whiteboarding. So I will say like, if you don't have folders set up and students are um, whiteboarding and then it goes to their journal, you have to sift through everybody's journal to find that activity. Whereas if they save it to a folder, then you can filter by folder and quickly see their whiteboarding activities. So that's my number one tip for whiteboarding. Make sure you have a folder that they're saving it to. And yes, go back and look at it. Pick one or two of the slides to really look at and give some feedback and grade. Amazing, amazing. Awesome. Well, we're going to go ahead and just kind of close things up. First of all, Kelly, thank you so much for sharing such amazing information. I know there's tons of other things happening in the chat, lots of insights, lots of thank yous and things, but I just want to make sure that we have the opportunity to give you guys everything you need so that you can get to your next session on time as well. So we hope you enjoyed our session. Your PD certificate will be emailed to you, so be on the lookout for that. All the recordings that we just had today, this session recording, along with every recording that you attend, will also come to you as well starting August 4th. So give us about 48 hours to make sure that we get that out the door. If you have time, please visit the networking tab to chat with other educators from around the world and to earn points in the leaderboard. Remember, the top 50 people win prizes on the leaderboard, so make sure you're joining all the sessions and participating as well. We're going to do a giveaway here in just a second. I'm going to click back on this. We'll open up our giveaway here. I'm going to spin this fantastic prize and it'll pick two winners. We'll be reaching out to these winners separately. Uh, so just so you know, if your name is picked, 
We're going to make sure we follow up with you via email. So we have Pamela and Karen. Welcome uh, to the awesome prize winning crew. We're going to go ahead and uh, again, reach out to you guys later on uh, via email, but we do appreciate you all being here today. We appreciate you taking time to be at Connect. We have so many more amazing sessions that are happening. So we just hope that you can glean a little bit more from your continued learning here at CESA. So thank you for being a part of Connect 2024. I hope that you guys have a wonderful rest of your session and I'm going to close down our recording. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody.